everyone, and welcome to another episode of Bard Brunch. Uh, I am your host, Jenny Yosko. I uh, hurt my cornea the other day. I scratched it, so I'm not wearing a contact in the side. So my depth perception is really off, so we're going to have a fun time cooking today. Um, today, also, my guest is going to be, once again, Christopher Carter Sanderson from Gorilla Rap Theater. Um, yes, uh, we had Gorilla Rap Theater on... Um, quite a few episodes ago uh, to talk about their uh, iPhone Macbeth, which was really spectacular, really wonderful. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, Macbeth because there's like a free screening coming up and all of that fun stuff. We're going to post the links to that in the comments and all that. But also, there's a production of Hamlet coming up as well. So we're going to talk about all good things, all wonderful things. Uh, but before we get into that, I'm going to be making a double, double chocolate trouble pancake or two pancakes. Because I'm starving, by the way. I have not eaten today yet. and I've been up since 8 a.m. All right. So honestly, first off, I'm just going to take some Bisquick because no matter how many times I try to make homemade pancakes, it never tastes as good as Bisquick. It's Bis. It's quick. It's Bisquick. Yeah. What I'm actually going to do first is pan this with the uh, thing off so the aerosol doesn't psh, like it did that one time and blow up my eyebrows. Okay. Uh -huh. I'm going to get a little something also to do. Spoon out my biscuit. You can see really closely this eye is like, it's like a very closed eyes because I have uh, tried to mask how um, not great it's feeling. But uh, still kind of, it's like it's in its, it's in its healing stages. It's in its healing stages. Um, all right, so this quick is our base. And what we're just going to do is have two different kinds of chocolate chips involved. I'm going to get into my Ghirardelli white chocolate chips. Y'all have seen me use these a lot before. If you've seen any of my, um, like, one-off cooking shows or anytime I've made any, um, any hot chocolate bombs. That and then also my milk chocolate chocolate chips. Uh, some people prefer a chocolate, pa like, pancake with their chocolate chips. I think that's uh, too much chocolate and then you don't taste the chips. I'd like to taste the chips. So I usually do a, a buttermilk pancake base and then just overload it with chips. All right. Also, because I can't really see, we're going to guess at some point as to when I flip it. Making all of my Hello Fresh dinners um, this week has been rough because, again, no depth perception, and there's things like, cut the carrots, and I'm like, oh, my thumb's cut off half the time. Uh, poor Poppy has no idea what to do when we play fetch, so I'm just like, nah, and then it goes somewhere. She has no idea where it is. I have no idea where it is. It's a ton. Um, I also today got to uh, screen manage the last show up kids of this year. Um, where has this year gone? To the internet. It's gone to the internet. All right. Let's see if it's time to flip you. Maybe. We're gonna, we're just gonna flip you and figure it out. Yeah, seems like you're pretty solid on that side. Bam, all right. That's doing its thing, that's gonna be a big pancake. I like my pancakes thick with three C's, I love it. Um, I also have this little tiny bit right here that hasn't been. Mmm, yeah, you're a good girl. All right, oh, Bobby just barked. <laughs> and she's my good girl. And Jeremy said, good girl. And then she's now desperately trying to break free from the confines of Texas. <laughs> she wants to know what she did to make herself a good girl, um, which is understandable. If someone tells you, you hear from off in the distance, uh, someone praising you, you're going to be like, what did I do? What did I do? Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So that's one. One's down. I'm going to make a second one. I'm so hungry. It's Jenny from the brunch. I'm still, I'm still Jenny from the brunch. Used to have a little bit too much, but I'm still, I'm still Jenny from the brunch. Okay. Ah, I'm dropping everything. I'm dropping everything. All right. I'm going to do another one because, again, I'm hungry. Poppy, I understand that you uh, think that I'm the best thing in the world, but also we uh, need to understand that I can't pay attention to you 24-7. So I have this thing that I'm doing. Come on, come on, be quick. Be quick. Oh well, okay. All right, I basically used up all of my Bisquick at this point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
I'm going to lower the temperature on that. I'm going to add some more chocolate chips because we have a new pancake. We have a new pancake, y'all. We have a new pancake. I am sleepy. Uh, tomorrow, I'm finally getting to mail out some uh, final round, I think, of my Christmas presents. Um, anyone from Chemical X watching? No? Good. Guess what I got all my Chemical X people. Um, if you can guess, you win my love and adoration, and also I'm probably going to tell you in a few seconds. Anyway. Is anyone guessing? Yes! Yes! You think it's going to be great, and then like when you get to the bottom, it's still like powdery, but it still tastes so good, so it's fine. Is anyone going to figure out what I got my uh, Powerpuff Girls improv show for Christmas? Each one individually. You're not going to guess, but I want to see some of your guesses. Sugar and spice and everything nice. You know what? You know what? That would be fun to just send them a bunch of cooking stuff and be like, have at it. Do what you need to do. But that's not what happened. Um, you can get customized bobbleheads. <laughs> and uh, again, I hope none of them are watching. Or if you are, spoiler alert. You're getting a bobblehead for Christmas. Um, I do really good for Christmas, so that's fine. All right. So you're actually like burnt on the bottom. I'm gonna turn them a little bit quick off this spatula. Bobbleheads, yes. Um, they're very cute. They're very wonderful. I'm super happy with them. I'm mailing them all out tomorrow. So, um, they're not going to get to them by Christmas. But that's fine. It'll be like a post Christmas, pre New Year, happy life thing. All right. I'm going to put the prettier one on the top for me to show you all. Because <laughs> this, this second one that I made is going to taste real good. I know it's going to taste better of the two, but it's not as pretty. So for the, uh, for the reveal, yes, it's so cute, it's so pretty, and my one eye is still like, hello, I am here to do brunch with you all. Um, side note, this is a um, Shakespeare-themed brunch, not a brunch-themed Shakespeare. We're not doing a Shakespeare show that's set at brunch. Um, it is a um, Shakespeare-themed brunch food. While I set up my Shakespeare themed brunch food over my table, um, some of you may have seen this little trailer before, but we're gonna play it again. It's a little trailer for uh, the uh, I from Macbeth from uh, Gorilla Rep Theater. I'm gonna talk about that. I'm gonna talk about their upcoming stuff. We're gonna have a fun time. See you in a bit. Who bid thee join with us? Macbeth. It needs not our mistrust since he delivers our offices and what we have to do to the direction just. Then stand with us. West your glimmers with some streaks of day. Now spurs a lady traveler apace to gain the timely inn and near approaches the subject of our watch. Hark! I hear horses. Give us a light there. Oh. Tis he. The rest are within the of expectation already are in the courts. His horses go about. Almost a mile, but he does usually. So all men do. From hence to the palace gate make it their walk. A light, a light. Tis he. Stand to it! It will be rain tonight. Then let it come down! <laughs> Treachery, fly good play on Fly, fly, fly! <laughs> now me <mate>, for <revenge. laughs> <laughs> Who did strike out the light? What's not the way? There's but one down. The sun is fled. We have lost best half of our affair. Well, let's away and say what is done. You know your own degrees. Sit down. At first and last, the hearty welcome. Thanks to your majesty. Thanks to your majesty. Ourself will mingle with society. And play the humble host. Our hostess keeps her state, but in best time we will require her welcome. 
Pronounce it for me, sir, to all our friends, for my heart speaks they are welcome. See, they encounter thee with their hearts. Thanks. Both sides are even. Here I'll sit in the mist, be large in mirth. Anon, we'll drink a measure of the table round. Hey. <laughs> There's blood on thy face. Tis bank was then. Tis better thee without than he within. Is he dispatched? My lord, his throat is cut. That I did for him. Oh, thou art the best of the cutthroats, yet he is good. That did the like for Fleance. If thou didst it, thou art the non pareil Most royal, sir. Fleance is scaped. Then comes my fit again. I had else been perfect. Whole as the marble founded, as the rock, as broad in general as the casing air. But now I am cavern, cribbed, confined, bound into saucy doubts and fears. Uh, but but was safe. Aye, my good lord. Safe in a ditch he bides, with twenty trenched gashes on his head. The least a death to nature. Uh, thanks for that. There the grown serpent lies. The one that's fled hath nature, but in time will venom breed. No teeth for the present. Get thee gone. Tomorrow we'll hear ourselves again. My royal lord, you do not give the cheer. The feast is sold that is not often vouched. While tis a making, tis given with welcome. To feed were best at home. From thence, the sauce to meat is ceremony. The meeting were bare without it. Sweet remembrance, sir. Now, good digestion wait on appetite. And health on both. May it please your majesty, sit. Ah, here had we now our countries on a roof with the grace person of our Banquo present, who may I rather challenge for kindness than pity for mischance. His absence, sir, lays blame upon his promise. Please, your highness, to grace us with your royal company. The table's full. Here's a place reserved, sir. Where? Here, my good lord. <sighs> what is it that moves your highness? Which of you have done this? What is it, my lord? What, my good lord? Thou canst not say I did it! You can take off the privacy screen. Ah! I still remember watching that for the first time and being so amazed by it. So please, please welcome friend of the show, Christopher from Grilla Theater! Yay! Hello, everyone. Yeah? Yay! Yay! Great! Oh my god, my dog is going crazy. How are you doing? <laughs> I am well. Poppy, how are you doing? I am doing well. Yay! Wonderful! Oh my god. Love that. I'm dealing with a manic puppy right now. She's she great. She really wants these chocolate pancakes. Absolutely. She's adorable. She wants these chocolate pancakes and she can't have them because she's a dog and that would be not good. Chocolate <laughs> and dogs. Dogs can't have chocolate. Can't. Um, so please tell everyone at home because uh, your Macbeth has gone on to, to win some prestigious things and all of that fun stuff. So please uh, tell everyone at home uh, what's going on with your Macbeth since you were on the show. Wow. Thank you for asking. Um, since I was last on this wonderful show, um, <laughs> Macbeth uh, won a uh, Best Director at the Berlin Underground Theater, uh, sorry, Film Festival. The Berlin Underground Film Festival decided to give me best director. For God's sake, it's earned on the hard work of all these wonderful people in the cast. And I'm tremendously grateful. Um, you'd think that would be all, but more has happened. Uh, we went to the American film market, put together a, a VOD deal with the Louisiana channel, and uh, posted it for the rest of the dissemination uh, on Vueler, and we'll see where that goes. Uh, in the meantime, two other amazing things happened. All of it's just, just such a huge thing. Hi, Poppy. Uh, for me, is um, we uh, uh, we got into um, the Berlin Hall, the Berlin International Film Festival. So that'll be in uh, in April. But in the meantime, we we're just absolutely delighted. I'm kind of out of my mind with this. Uh, we got uh, into uh, New Filmmakers New York. Uh, which is a festival in New York City. Of course, it'll be streaming, which means it'll be an opportunity for everyone to see the film for free. Uh, yay. Again, yay. So Gorilla Rep's you know, big thing is free theater, free high-quality theater. So it's really nice to be able to say to everybody, you know, it's, it's been absolutely unbelievable the deluge of requests we've had from people wanting to see Macbeth, largely because of your show, and we're very grateful. Um, but here it is, February uh, 10th at 8 p.m. with New York uh, new filmmakers. Uh, people will be able to screen it uh, for free. So that's what's that's what's all what's new with Macbeth. Uh, 
it led to a fantastic Facebook fundraiser on Giving Tuesday, which shocked me. Uh, we've gotten together enough um, resources to be in production for two more films in this vein, and we're in pre-production for a whole bunch more. Yes, amazing. And we're going to post the link to where people can watch your, your February Macbeth, right? Yes? Thank yeah! you. Yeah! We're going to post that in the comments. So great. Everyone can just click on that and go right to it, and it'll be awesome. <sighs> So please um, tell me what you have coming up. Oh, thank you for asking. Well, uh, Mac, uh, Macbeth uh, has, has propelled us into uh, Hamlet, uh, which uh, has an interesting backstory with Gorilla Rap. I've directed Hamlet uh, now one, two, three, four times. This will be my fifth time uh, directing Hamlet. Uh, so... You know, similar to Macbeth being the first one I thought up to, to do close up in 2003 and finally did it, you know, in the COVID, uh, Macbeth has a, a rich history. So we went to that immediately. Um, we're going to go into production for Macbeth in February. Expect to have it finished by June. Get out to all the festivals in June. Uh, we'll go into production uh, for Romeo and Juliet. Yay! Oh Hopefully by the time that's done, we will have had... 2021 will come and go and um i'm hoping that a summer of 2022 might see another gorilla rep show actually outdoors uh for people where they are for free we'll see so, um, you can you can of course um not give everything away but what what are some things that people should expect uh with your upcoming pieces to to be on the lookout for to look forward to all that stuff you mean you don't want me to tell people that Hamlet dies in the end? Oh, you ruined it. Spoiler right. alert. <laughs> right oh. Well, there's a lot to say about, about Hamlet. Um, I will I will say that uh, in the first days of COVID, I just started working on Macbeth. Uh, very, you know, it was an impulse. It felt right. I went with it, um, you know, and uh, and the results have been just, you know, I didn't have time to think about where it would all where it would all end up, and it's all end up in so much so many wonderful places. Uh, that one of the things it's done is um, it's gotten very uh, smart people to wrestle me into the idea of making film a little bit more on film's terms. Of course, Macbeth is pretty much entirely on theater's terms, uh, and I just you know basically I always said what I want is the right people for the role and smart people said, that's great, but you should also take some time to look for the right people for the role who also happen to be famous uh, and will get people to watch, watch your films. Uh, so that makes sense to me. So uh, in creating the, co the cast for Hamlet, I, I really went to some old uh, pros. They're not actually old uh, annually, but I'm talking about people who've been in a lot of guerrilla rep shows the same way that we had Mac with Macbeth. So, um, our, our Hamlet is Henry Austin Chicago, and he's brilliant. Um, I know him from other contexts. We were actually professors together uh, at State University of New York. Uh, he's a, gr a recent graduate of the Harvard uh, graduate program. And I think this is going to be a breakout role for him. I wanted to, that set a high, high bar, and I wanted to just reach it, you know, uh, with all the other actors. We, we've got um, Athena Reich, who I've worked with, will be playing Gertrude. Jonathan Wexler, who you saw as Banquo, will be back to play Horatio, which is a key role. Key yeah. role. Yeah, yeah, it's key. Um, and, um, and you saw our lady, our lady Macbeth, will be showing a completely different side of her work. That uh, Megan Bloomfoot will be playing Ophelia. So it's going to be a hell of a high bar. Um, however, in sort of looking around and talking to people and talking to agents and managers um, and, and an old friend, uh, we did. We did try to talk to a couple of people about get about getting names, and so where we're at with Hamlet is that the, the Hamlet cast is only missing one more. The IMDb uh, page is up, so if you want to look at it, it's there. Um, we have two interesting announcements uh, in terms of that sort of film way of looking at casting. One is a fantastic actor, Robin Ellis, who many people will know if they are uh, watching your show, if they're older, or if they're big BBC fans. Robin Ellis played Poldark in the original BBC Poldark. That was a giant hit uh, in, in America. And as you might imagine, he is older now. So he'll be playing the ghost of old Hamlet for us. That is amazing. It awesome. is amazing. It's amazing. I, I am delighted. I'm so sorry to keep hearing Poppy yell. Uh, she's watching on the tech booth screen. 
She gets uh, a little bit obsessed with certain people that I uh, talk to online or screen manage. So she, she, I think she has a little bit of an obsession with you right now, and she wants to play with you real hard, and she doesn't know why you can't pet her. So that's why she keeps yelling. <laughs> Believe me, I understand. And uh, if I keep talking but through her yelling, I've got to tell you, um, I have uh, both a, um, a wonderful three-year-old son and a Jack Russell Terrier. So I'm quite used to talking through people barking at me. <laughs> yeah, Robin Ellis is not only a brilliant actor, you know, a, a fantastic, you know, RSC vintage, you know, amazing actor. Um, he's also just an absolutely wonderful person. And, uh, you know, I felt like there was so much room, you know, for people to, to uh, the, the way we're working is beautiful and wonderful when you experience it. But when you talk about it before someone's actually seen it, it's very easy to just for people to dismiss because it's just too different. And Robin Ellis' reaction was exactly the opposite. He was like, it sounds really interesting. Let me look at it. Once he looked at it, he said, no, I love the idea. It's something absolutely new. And, and I'm happy to, to just, you know, I couldn't ask for a warmer, kinder, uh, you know, response and, and a more, um, uh, you know, artistic embrace from just an absolutely fantastic actor. We're also lucky that his wife uh, is a former TV producer and um, we're, and so she's willing to help us with the camera work a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it is fantastic. And then another another name uh, it's got to be admitted in our cast is is a uh, playing the cameo uh, crucial role of Voltamon, the, the foreign ambassador. Uh, it's going to be I'm going to give you a scoop on this. This is a tester for this actor because this is the actor who I want to play King John for uh, Gorilla Rep's film of King John, which I hope will be happening in, in concert with a with a production. Um, but if not, we'll do the film first. Um, and this this actor is a friend of mine. We went to school together. We were at the Experimental the Theater Wing together. And he was in one of the first plays that I produced and directed in, in New York. It was called The uh, Reckoning. It's a new play, a wonderful play, off, off an off-Broadway production. Um, and he did a great job. And, and he went on to have a very different uh, path. He chose the path of being a master yoga teacher. He's one of the like most revered and sought after yoga teachers in the world for a very good reason. He's got a giant heart. He's a warm practice. He's just, um, you know, when you go through one of his yoga classes, you know, you come out of it feeling elated and calm and great. And then a couple of hours later, you're like, oh my God, I'm, I haven't been this sore ever in my entire life. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like the next day you wake up and you're like, I kind of can't move um, because he's just so wonderful. And, and his name is Dachin Thurman. And, uh, and I will say that he's been, um, you know, wonderful about staying in dialogue with me about, about being an actor, even as he's moved off in different directions. And, you know, for good reason. I mean, it's, it's no, no, um, I mean, he wouldn't say this, but it's, it's no, um, you know, secret that he was in a very bad film of Hamlet that was a, a horrible failure. Um, and because the director had no idea what they were doing, whatever they are as an actor, they were, they're no director of Hamlet and, and they really fucked up Hamlet. So maybe the fact that Dachin is a part of this is a, is a signal from the gods uh, that we're trying to rectify the world by making a really great Hamlet movie, totally uncut, two hours and 40 minutes, mark my words, uncut, and, and Dachin Thurman will be playing Voltamon for us. Look, look to his performance because we're hoping that he'll come back uh, as, as King John in the future. And I don't care who knows. Yes. Oh, I love that. I, I love this. this uh, I always call it exercising the demons um, where when you, when you see something like bad or something bad happens and then you just like decide to do it over or do it better and stuff like that. So I love that you're exercising the demons of this, this other Hamlet that y'all saw. And it's, it's not. Well, the Dachin was in. Dachin, Dachin played, I think it was Rosencrantz in Ethan Hawke's Hamlet. And uh, Ethan yeah. Hawke's Hamlet yeah. sucks. And I don't care who hears me say it because it's simply true. That's what I thought you meant. But I was like, maybe I should not put my Ethan Hawke's Hamlet like biases onto this conversation. No, Ethan Hawke's Hamlet was so bad that he let Bill Murray actually do the wrong lines as Polonius. And believe me, I'm an Ethan Hawke fan. I think that that there are very few film actors who can act on film in the way that Ethan Hawke can. He, he would, he does what I would call playing actions incredibly well with the camera and to the camera. And he had absolutely no business um, taking a concept and a play that he just did not understand. And, and he ended up splattering his inability to understand it all over the, all over the film. And then we all had to kind of deal with that. So whatever the past is prologue motherfucker. It's and, great uh, 
You know, it's funny because I believe that Dachin probably saw my thesis production of Hamlet. My thesis production for uh, at, N at New York University was Hamlet, actually, as an undergraduate. Uh, and then later, um, I directed a, an indoor workshop of it, which I invited uh, the New York Times to send a critic to because I've got balls and I care <laughs> about this shit. And uh, yeah. they actually, they did it. They sent Ann Majette and she's a very insightful critic. And she would have said if she thought it wasn't working and she was really clear about what she saw. It's funny because we did that workshop and then uh, I went to uh, Kuwait with the United States Navy for a year of active duty to earn the money to do the full production. Then in the summer of 2010, I did the full production uh, and the guy who had played Hamlet in the workshop uh, pretty much dropped out. Um, and, and basically I got on the airplane to go to Kuwait and the guy had dropped out. Like he, I basically was reading my email, like as the plane was taxiing, he was like, you know, just the whole like, yeah, it was great. Yeah, it was intense. Yeah, we got a great New York Times review. Yeah, the audience loved it. But I can't, I just can't deal with the idea of doing it outside and I'm not going to do it. Wheels up. I'm in Kuwait. And you'd think, you'd think, right? You'd think that I was fucked. But here's the thing. I was not fucked. And I'll tell you why. Because I kept my ears open and kept my eyes open. And after I got bored in Kuwait for about six months, I called up the, the guy at, at American University of Kuwait, who I knew was an American. I said, hey, you're running a theater uh, program over there, like one man show. Believe it or not, I'm in country. And if you'd like me to come over and, and lecture, I'd be willing to ask my commanding officer. Do you know, it took me three hours to convince that guy that I was me. And the reason was, finally, after three hours, he said, listen, when I got to Kuwait, Arab, Arab culture doesn't deal with theater very well. There's kind of a disconnect. So I bought 12 books and I made my students read them. I said, these are 12 books about different ways of doing theater that might help you figure out how to make it fit in Arab society. And I'm telling you, one of them was your book, Guerrilla Theater from Routledge. So it's been hard for me to believe that the gods have dropped you in my lap. And I'm like, yeah, I am. So we talked to the embassy. We talked to my commanding, my commanding officer. I went to the American University of Kuwait and I lectured three times on Shakespeare. At the end of the three times, I said to Christopher Gottschalk, who was the guy who, who ended up, who was there doing the, the, the teaching the program, I said, you know, Chris, I get the strong vibe from you that you're an actor. You know, you've got a, you, you graduated from the Globe, San Diego. Like, I feel like you're an actor. Could I see your monologues? I mean, is that crazy to ask? And he was like, no, I'd love to do my monologues. So he did his monologues. I said, hey, man, they're great. And, and period, they're just great. They're great the way they are. But that Henry V one, could I direct it as if it was like a guerrilla rep show? Can I try that with you? And he was like, sure, sure, sure. Like he was hungry for it. So I gave him some direction. He did it. We went outside afterwards and he was having a cigarette and I was talking to him, you know, and, uh, and he sort of took a, took a cigarette and he sort of said, man, I've got to do some acting. And I said, man, you've got to come to New York City and play Hamlet for me at the Cloisters next summer. And he was like, you're kidding. And I'm like, you have the summer off. Am I wrong? He's like, no, I have the summer off. And I'm like, you want the job. You got it. In the middle of the desert, in the middle of fucking Kuwait, the I gods had not abandoned me. Oh, but, my God. So he said, I'll, he said, I'll do it. What do you need me to do? And I was like, I need you to be off book when the plane lands in New York City. He said, I will do it. He hired two of his students to assist him to get off book. He landed off book and was like, this is it, man. The acting starts when you're off book. Let's do it. I can't wait to hear the other voices. And he propelled uh, that production to the point where uh, the New York Times rave review in the New York Times that came out, like of the three columns, like the entire first column is all about how brilliant he is. Well, it's a little bit about how brilliant the setting is, but then most of it's about how brilliant he is. And then it talks about how great the show is. So at the end of the day, you just hang in there and you keep working. Man. That's, that's amazing. I, oh, I love stories like that. And this is, it's just such proof that like, sometimes when you get screwed over by the universe, it's for something better to come along. Yeah, well, Danny, I, I wasn't screwed over by the universe. I was screwed over by an actor. So, <laughs> you know, like, let's be real here. It was just, it's like, it could feel like, you know, the world, but it ain't. It's just one dude. And I kept my mind going and I kept my life going and we had time to do it. And I found, and when trust had been let down, I found another person to trust in. I trusted I them that. again. And they, they fucking blew it out of the park, man. The next, the next time I directed Hamlet was one actor memorized all 1,955 lines and did a one-man Hamlet. The conceit was that it was William Shakespeare saying Hamlet 
And uh, we did that at the um, at the uh, uh, Kentucky Rep, and it was a, a wonderful run. We were preparing to do a run of it, the One Man Hamlet, next to the Shakespeare uh, statue in Central Park. When the guy who did it, wonderful actor who's uh, eulogized at the in the end credits of Macbeth, um, Greg Petroff, um, unfortunately died of cancer. So that was that. And then it's like, well, hmm, you know, and then it came up, man. It came up like Macbeth is this strong in the zeitgeist. What is even stronger? What's going to be stronger on the other side of COVID? And the answer that my creative spirit gave me was Hamlet. I'm delighted that, that you guys read that book, by the way. Thanks for posting that comment. So all kinds of folks are back. Our Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, our Bruce, who you saw as, as Ross in, in Macbeth, um, and, and Linda, who you saw as Witch Number One, is back as Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. So. Yes. Yep. Uh, many, of the, many of the young women that you saw uh, will be playing the soldiers that are in the first scene uh, and, a, and a little bit later. Um, because I thought that really, really worked well. Um, I'm really, and, and, uh, the one thing I can say about Hamlet is, uh, gender parity. 22 okay. roles, 11 women, 11 men. Yes. Love that. Love Thanks. that. That's good well, it's teeing it up for Romeo and Juliet. Cause I have a, con a frame story on Romeo and Juliet and Romeo and Juliet will be all female. I'm excited for that. <laughs> Thanks. I hope the world is. I'm pretty psyched. The, um, you know, Hamlet is, uh, I was rehearsing. Well, I shouldn't say rehearsing. I was having a dramaturgical meeting uh, with, with uh, Hank uh, Chicago this morning. And, um, you know, uh, any day where I need to pull down uh, my first folio is a good day. And uh, any day where I need to resort to my uh, underbridge dictionary or my Shakespeare lexicon is a good day. But a day where I need to pull all three of them down is a great day. <laughs> yes, a great day. Ah. Hey, um, any day with chocolate chip pancakes is a great day. So this day has really got a lot going for it. My internet keeps going out. So I keep being like, yay. And then it's like, your internet is out. I'm like, no, I'm reacting, I swear. <laughs> I'm also Thank you. All of this. <laughs> Thank you. So for um, the, the people who have uh, seen you on here before, this may be a little redundant, but we have new viewers. We always have new people watching. So uh, please tell me some of, some of the uh, pitfalls of doing this new media. And then... Tell me some of the things that actually worked out a lot better that you, you didn't expect to be better, but they actually were now that we are in this digital landscape. Well, um, the first thing that occurred to me was that Zoom uh, sucks, as you've just amply demonstrated. Um, it's, it's fine for talk shows and, and stuff like that. Um, but when the Internet goes out, that's no good for your narrative flow. And the quality of the, um, the picture is not good enough uh, for theatrical use. And the quality of the sound is not dynamic enough or a wide enough mix for the, for theatrical use. Also, if you'll notice, um, like two thirds of this frame that I'm in is being completely wasted. Like I'm, this is where I am, yeah. where I am speaking, right? Um, so my immediate thought was, well, I need, I'm what, look, I'm always the person that wants to say the one crazy question, which is no matter how fucked up things are, is there a way that we could actually use this as an opportunity to make them better, right? So no matter how fucked up it was that the dude quit on me to play Hamlet, I was sitting there in my bunk thinking, yeah, but how can I make this, use this to make it better, right? It doesn't always work, I admit that, and I've got the scars to show for it. But uh, how could this COVID thing actually make theater better? And I was like, oh, make film. I'm like, well, we need 4K cameras. And I was like, well, fuck me. Everyone's carrying 4K cameras around in their goddamn pockets. Let's make a film, guys. I was like, wow, I'll have to think of a concept. I'm like, no, you won't, you idiot. You've been talking about Macbeth close up for 11 years or whatever it is, 17 years at this point. Just do it. And I was like, all right, well, maybe this is the time to just do it. And I think that, you know, regarding my book, um, you know, the manifesto at the begins, beginning says, kill the dinosaurs uh, and eat the dinosaurs. 
Um, and you know, the funny thing is I've lived to see the dinosaurs have an extinction event. <laughs> so I didn't have to kill any dinosaurs at all. I just had to be a small, warm blooded rodent running around. So all those, those guys would be killed by the comet or the whatever, the volcano or whatever it was. Actually, I think it was comet and, uh, and continue to thrive and evolve myself, you know? So I'm seeing these giant theater companies just having a horrible time and, and I feel terrible for them. And, I, and I'm I really, really feel bad. I do sincerely. But at the same time, analytically, analytically, I have to say, well, this is the extinction event. Um, you know, um, amateur theater uh, pretending to be professional theater should should uh, go ahead and uh, lit and be extinct in this ice age. And we should make things that are better for theater, which is that we should make high standards for all theater. Whenever someone charges you for a ticket, you should expect the very, very best, highest quality professional work. And that's what can be can be better about this, you know. So what sucks about it is, you know, two members of my cast's fathers died. That sucked. I was worried. What if my cast members die? That sucks. What if my cast members go in, go into the hospital halfway through production? Well, that would suck. But it's no reason to stop trying. So we kept trying and 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 it, and made it, you know. So what sucks about it is. We had no coordinated national response to the to the plague we were going through because we had a jackass for president. That sucks. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, on top of the fact that we have no national infrastructure for the arts, which sucks. You know, we got no. Uh, you know, in the 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 amount of money we spend per capita on the arts, just to make sure that we have them and that they're robust in America is minuscule compared to any other industrialized nation. So when people start trumpeting about, you know, all other industrial nations have universal health care, I'm like, you're right, they do. And it blows that all we got was mediocre insurance reform. But friends, that's the tip of the iceberg. That's not the big problem. That's the tip of the goddamn iceberg. And one of the things about it is, you know, we, we don't pump money into the arts to make sure that it is strong and robust and can get through times like this. So we have no choice as, a, as an industry, but to handle it as an extinction event. And let me tell you something, the big, the big secret, the big, you know, uh, 600 pound, you know, elephant in the room that nobody talks about is that the vast majority of professional artists uh, have some kind of other way of supporting themselves. I've never met an opera, an opera singer who was 100% an opera singer all the time, not in America. Uh, even ones who have done pretty big art, opera opera houses, they've got to have some other way to do it or they'd be living in penury. They're living on on food stamps, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, we just tend to tend in the arts have a little bit more integrity uh, than, you know, Walmart. So uh, we're not really interested in being on on assistance when we're not working. So we have to find other things to do it. The way that an industrialized nation should operate which is we should have a large uh, endowment for the arts. Now you're thinking to yourself, but we have the National Endowment for the Arts. Bullshit. Complete, total bullshit. The National Endowment for the Arts is not an endowment. It's not an endowment. It's literally a line item in the Congress, which they can argue over, or if the Republicans feel like they need a whipping person, they will whip that, you know? They'll be like, no, no, this is funding pornography, blah, 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 at the tiny, tiny infinitesimal levels to which it funds anything, right? That's nonsense. We should have an endowment. We should have a separate amount of money that the Congress maybe throws money into, but the amount of money itself should be separate and independent from politics. It should grow. And then the money we make on that money should be invested into the arts in a big way, the way that other industrialized nations do, so that we can be a cultural leader the way that we're a monetary leader and a capitalistic leader. We can also be a cultural leader. Say, no, no, these are good things. We can lead with our minds. We can lead with what we know is great. Like Shakespeare, for fuck's sake. <laughs> I love it. I love it so much. I love having you on the program because you're just, you're so honest about things. There's, there's no like saccharine nonsense going on here. You are like, to the point. And I'm like, this is fantastic. This is going to be a great interview. Well, glad. Jenny, listen, if you wanted somebody who was going to be charming, you should have scheduled one of the actors. <laughs> I mean, you're, you are charming. Again, my, my dog is obsessed with you. So there's that. <laughs> of course, the question that I ask everyone is, please tell us a horror story, an onstage horror story of yours. Um, one of mine, I... I I haven't even talked about this one on the program yet, actually. It was back during high school when I was doing uh, Taming of the Shrew in my senior year. And um, 
I was uh, being Kate and my Petruchio had not shown up to uh, any, basically any of the rehearsals. So not only was I like mumbling his lines to him on stage throughout the entire scene, um, but there was also a kiss scene in it because it is one of uh, Shakespeare's romantic comedies. And I dipped him and he would always forget even a semblance of what he was supposed to say next. Um, so on our final matinee, um, we do this, and then he's supposed to say a line to me, and I'm just holding him there, and I'm like, I don't, I don't know where to go. I didn't, you were supposed to, I just got, and I was like 18 years old at the time, so I'm not like brilliant at improvising at this point. So I just go, better late than never, right? And then we leave. And that was just... Oh, so yeah. <laughs> Well, if you want my high school theater story, I can give you my high school theater story. It's not right. quite the same. My really, the short story of, of what one of my high school theater onstage horror story is that um, at dress rehearsal, um, I was so excited for dress rehearsal of uh, the uh, Agatha Christie that we were doing. And I played the sort of uh, the romantic rube who kind of finally gets the girl at the end. Um, uh, the character, as I recall, his name maybe was Thomas Royd. I'm trying to remember the title of the play. But um, we, uh, I got to, got to dress rehearsal early because I was so excited, right? I sat down. I realized I hadn't, I was so excited I hadn't eaten lunch. I hadn't eaten a damn thing. So my friend, um, Jenny, wanders through and she's like, I'm like, God, I'm starving. She's like, oh, that reminds me. I made brownies. Here, have a brownie. And I was like, Great. And so I took the brownie. She's like, enjoy it. And I was like, thank you. And I like ate the brownie, right? Yeah. Oh, no. mm -hmm. The oh, whole no. brownie. No. <laughs> yeah, I ate the whole brownie. Oh, so uh, suddenly as I'm in the middle of rehearsal, the lights get really bright and I feel really warm. And like, and I'm kind of like, I remember grinning like a big fool. Um and then there was a at the back of the at the back of the stage there was a drop and then there was a trap right and it was about a like you know about a three foot wide trap and and we didn't have any reason when we made crosses we made them in front of the drop because there was a window and stuff there was no reason to go behind the drop at all right but um, sometime later I woke up down in the trap on top of a whole bunch of flats <laughs> and I kind of was like wow what happened I still actually don't remember what happened. Um, <clears throat> I kind of dusted myself up, dusted myself up, kind of got up, you know, looked around. I, I wasn't really hurt or anything. And, um, <clears throat> I went outside and it was very late at night. Uh, I was like damn close to dinner time, probably seven or eight. I walked home in the cold, uh, pretty much dropped into my bed and fell asleep. And, uh, everybody was like, where were you? Where were you? Where were you? What happened? What happened? And I was like, I must have fallen in. So it kind of saved my ass because I was able to say, I must have fallen in the trap and it knocked me out. <laughs> Bullshit. I was stoned off my ass. <laughs> that brownie had more than a, a gram and a half of really good hash in it. Wow. She, like, she had an older brother who was like the real deal for a hookup. And the next day I was like, what was in that brownie? And she's like, about a gram and a half of really good hash. I hope you didn't eat it all at once. <laughs> I was like, I think I did right before I went to rehearsal and like walked into the trap and was asleep for four hours. So um, that's my crazy story about high school. I got a crazy story about that Hamlet we did in, in uh, up at the cloisters, if you'd like. Yes, I would love. Well, 12 days before we opened, the woman playing Gertrude broke her ankle getting into the subway. Oh, my God. Eight days before we opened, the guy playing Rosencrantz had a stroke. Three days before we opened, the guy playing uh, eight of the smaller roles decided that, oh, you know what? He really did need to go back to Westchester to get a job before he went back to school after all. Yep. Oh my God. So um, the woman playing Gertrude was a trooper. She got a cast on, and she came in and actually helped teach the blocking to the woman we got in to replace her. Um, the guy playing Rosencrantz had been – um, having trouble with his brain for a long time before the stroke. So the guy playing Guildenstern, talk about whispering your lines. The guy playing Guildenstern had been feeding him most of his lines anyway. So we, we rehearsed a guy to play it, but we just basically said, anytime you don't know your lines, look at Guildenstern. 
And so whenever he looked at Guildenstern, God bless him, Bruce Barton just barked out the line. And the funny thing is, it actually works because they're very interchangeable, as Stoppard noticed, right? And then with the guy, and then this is the thing, right? So we had busted, we did, we put in so many more hours of put in rehearsal to make those work, you know? At a certain point, uh, I looked at the guy, I looked at Chris, who was playing Hamlet, and I said, you know, if we get through this all right, the logo we had for Hamlet was a skull, as it always is, right? But if you look closely at the skull, it had a very short forehead. It was actually the skull of a gorilla. Get it? Gorilla reps Hamlet, right? I was like, you know what? If we get through this shit and actually open this show, I'm going to get that skull tattooed on my entire shoulder right here. And, and Chris said, I'm going to do it too if we get through this. And I said, well, I'm paying for that. I'm paying for both of ours. And he said, remember how you said you wanted to go, you like to jump out of airplanes and I've never done it. If we get out of this, you pay for the tattoos. I'm paying for us to jump out of an airplane. So we were managing to get through, managing to get through. And then this guy like literally says, I'm not doing these eight small parts and walks off the set. And, and you're thinking like, that's going to kill us. We're all thinking like, how are we going to do more put in rehearsal? How are we going to find someone to do this? And I'm shitting you not the two other actors who were playing the rest of the smaller roles, one of whom was Jonathan Reed Wexler, right? They walk up to me and Jonathan looks at me and he says, you know, we just talked it over and we can handle all eight. No problem. And I was like, you're kidding. And he's like, nope. And I was like, all right, everybody run through places, places. And he did it flawlessly. Oh my God. So we did the show and, uh, the weekend went marvelously. We were sold out. We, we couldn't fit another person into that yard right next to the cloisters, right? It was about 600 people a night. And uh, and we got in the car to uh, – so the night the, – after the last show, we went and got the tattoos. And then the next day, we, we drove upstate to jump out of an airplane. And when we got out of the airplane and we got off, got out of the parachutes, we realized we were really close to the hospital where Rosencrantz was, the guy who had the stroke, Right. Wow. So we went, we, we went over and we called ahead. He said, well, you know, I could use a jacket. I could use some soap. We brought him some stuff. You know, we said, Hey, we went out to the, uh, this is a great, great ending. I think we, we went out to the, to the, to the, to the parking lot and uh, we sat down and I, and I looked at my phone and I looked at Chris and I said, the New York times reviews out. And he said, you're kidding. And I said, no, nope. he said, well, how is it? And I said, I think you're going to want to call your mom. <laughs> it was a complete rave. It was a complete rave. It was, and not only that, it was a rave about him. So talk about, you know, his reward for hanging in there, you know, for all that work and just not letting, not letting go. You know what I mean? Don't let, don't defeat yourself. Let the thing defeat you. He just kept at it, you know, and, and um, we both got a tattoo and jumped out of an airplane as a result. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Oh my God. Yes. And you have to sometimes make those most biggest agreements with the actors also. It's like, if this happens, we're going to do a super fun, cool thing. So that way, like we have to get through it. To do a super fun, cool thing. Um, but yay. Awesome. Also, I'm terrified of airplanes. So I'm like jumping out of airplanes. I can be inside of one if I can't see the outside, but right. jumping out of one would more be a punishment for me. <laughs> if you don't learn these lines, you're going to have to jump out of an airplane. Yep, that's what I would do. <laughs> um, so before we wrap up, uh, is there anything else that you would like uh, the viewers at home to know about your upcoming projects? Well, uh, just, you know, keep an eye out for us. Um, you know, the, the goal here has always been to uh, to have a theatrical production uh, that that is well rehearsed and uh, provides the story well to the audience um, and then, then once that's happening in that creative, uh, you know, furnace to also forge an excellent film. So, you know, Girl Rep's done, you know, whatever it is now, 20 something years of forging the, the great performances theatrically. Now we've got a track record with Macbeth and we're going to have Hamlet. We're going to have a track record of forging these films. And if anyone knows of, of, of the dinosaurs who are managing to uh, survive this particular uh, extinction event and ice age, um, who are interested in getting with the innovation that's going to be the better theater after the COVID, please send them our way because we're going to be 100% ready to make fantastic guerrilla rep Shakespeare shows and other classics. And then when that happens, create the film and their 
that that theater's audience will be able to be the very first people who see the premiere of the of the film product as a reward. Amazing! I love that. Yay! Yay! Well, thank you You're so just... much for being on. I'm, Thanks so I'm much so for excited. having me. Yeah, I'm, I'm so excited to watch Macbeth again because I'm gonna watch the the February live stream again. It was wonderful. Yeah. It, I still talk about it as one of the most like fast paced Macbeth I've ever seen, and like. It's it's so good and like you, your attention is on it the entire time. And I'm like this is spectacular. So of course I'm gonna watch it again, and then I'm gonna of course watch your Hamlet and your all female Romeo and Juliet. And that. I'm so excited for everything that you're doing. So, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much for being on the show. Yay. My pleasure. Anytime. This is the best show ever. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh my god. Well, yay! Oh my god, that was amazing! As usual! Oh my god, I'm so happy. I'm so always happy to have Christopher on the show. Um, and Poppy just laid her head down to go to sleep because her new friend is on the screen anymore. I, apparently, I am chopped liver. Um, but anyway, uh, next week up on the show, we're going to have Are Our Souls Our Own, which is a uh, LA-based project, I believe, um, that is going to be uh, doing uh, an exploration of Shakespeare's female characters. So it's a bunch of uh, the female identifying actresses uh, all doing different excerpts from um, Shakespeare's projects that are all uh, based on the women that he has uh, created and brought forth in the world and an exploration of like, is this, is this something that still holds up today? What does this say about then? What does this say about now? A whole bunch of wonderful stuff. We're going to talk about that. Um, also, um, in the link tree that's scrolling at the bottom, uh, you'll be able to uh, find an, a link to my upcoming Festivus celebration. Um, and if anyone wants to still be involved with that, that is uh, Wednesday, uh, February 23rd. Um, all kinds of guests are going to be on and can still be on if y'all want to reach out. Um, you can do an airing of grievances. You can uh, prepare a Festivus meal. You can uh, perform a feat of strength. You can talk about Festivus miracle, whatever you want to do. I'm just here to party and have a good time. The show is free. It's a whole fun thing. You'll find a link to that. You'll also find a link to the uh, fundraiser that's still going on uh, for Sour Grapes Productions. Uh, it is going through my birthday, which is January 15th. So you have time. And also, it is a tax-deductible donation, which means if you've donated already this year, you can donate again next year and write it off twice. Hooray. But anyway, thank you again to uh, Christopher for coming on the show. I am going to force him to come back on the show when uh, his shows are closer to being in production. So, of course, you'll see him again. Poppy, are you awake? No? All right. Well, uh, thank you all for tuning in. I'm going to eat so much more food because I'm starving. Have a run. Yes, that. You know what? I'm out of the river.